Hi there. I'm Marla Folden, an SLP at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation in Burnaby, BC in Canada. And in this video, I'm going to be explaining audiology reports and how they relate to speech and language, kind of how we read those, how we interpret those to help other therapists, parents, supporters, whoever it is, kind of get a sense of where their student or child's hearing is at and how to understand what would be a good treatment if one is needed. So there's a few important parts in an audiological report. So we're gonna walk through them in order and we'll just see how we do. Okay, let me show you here. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is tympanometry, which is the assessment that audiologists will do to see how well the eardrum, you can imagine this is the eardrum, moves in response to pressure. Now, ideally we want the eardrum to move when there's air pressure from the outside. And a normal, what we would call a TIMP, looks like this, I'll get my blue marker. It's this blue one right here. And we want it to have this nice sharp peak. And then we want it to come down like that. So if you're seeing a shape like this in the tympanometry section of your audiological report, that is great. We like it actually this one right here. So that's the kind that we like to see. If it's open too much, it means that the bones in the ear are actually dislocated, but that's not something we want to see. Um, mostly right now I'm going to talk about the more common shape of TIMPs for our guys with Down syndrome, and that is this shape right here, which we call flat. Now there's a few reasons that a TIMP could be flat, and flat means that it's not flexing in response to pressure. It's kind of not moving at all. So what could be going on there? First thing could be an ear infection. If there's fluid behind the tympanic membrane, it cannot move when you add air pressure, right? Because the fluid is blocking that movement. Another common reason that a TIMP might be flat would be earwax buildup. So this would be on the other side. If there's a bunch of earwax here, you can shoot a whole bunch of air pressure at it, but it's not gonna move because the air pressure doesn't reach the eardrum, right? Another common reason is the probe is against the ear canal. So we know that for people with Down syndrome, their ear canals are really teeny tiny and really hard to see in there. And probably somebody's told you that along the line, like, oh, I can barely see what's going on in there. I don't know if there's wax. So if you're getting a flat tint, that's always something to consider. When they do a tympanometry assessment, they have to kind of really pull your ear and open up that canal. And the angle is very precise. So if it's off by even a little bit, the air pressure is going into the wall of the canal instead of straight at the eardrum. So it doesn't really flex because it's just hitting the wall instead, right? The last common reason that a tint might be flat in this particular group of people, people with Down syndrome, is that they've had tubes in the past and ear tubes are also called pressure equalization tubes or PE tubes. And what that means is they've gone in and put like, can you imagine like a little tiny bead, like something really small, teeny, teeny, tiny, that allows the pressure on one side of the eardrum to equal the other side of the eardrum. And they do that when there's a lot of ear infections or things going on in the middle ear that they wanna sort of equal out, right? Where it's usually ear infection. So then, the little tube makes a tiny hole and that's not a huge problem. Eardrums can heal. Um, but what it does mean is when you shoot a bunch of air pressure, it doesn't flex like this because the air just goes right through. So that would be another reason that it would be flat. Okay. Now tympanometry is the first audiological assessment because this is the outside most part of the ear that we care about in audiology. So if the student has a flat tympanogram, right, sort of this type B flat curve, then anything that we get in terms of sound field assessment after that, we kind of have to put some question marks around it because we don't know if it's because they actually can't hear well or if because there's so much wax in there or if there's an ear infection. If you can imagine an ear infection kind of feels like you're underwater with your hearing. So of course your hearing is not gonna be as accurate and precise if you've got an ear infection going on or if you have so much wax in there. 
So if this part hasn't gone well, you're not going to consider the next results to be super reliable. However, if you've got your really nice type A normal temp, then we're going to move to the next section, which is called an audiogram. Now, a lot of parents have seen a lot of these and they look like a big mess. So let's take a look at it and try and interpret it for everyone. This is an audiogram and let's walk through it here. So down on the bottom, we have loud. This kind of area right here. This is jet plane loud. Very, very loud sounds. And up here on the top, we have very quiet sounds. This is leaves falling. Sort of your meditative, really quiet noises, right? And the threshold for normal hearing is right here at 20 decibels. Whoop, right there. Okay, so that's the up and down sort of scale. The left to right scale is the pitch or also known as the frequency and it's measured in Hertz. So you don't have to start, worry about that. But so this is the low sounds. This is like your dogs growling, big trucks moving sounds down here. And it goes all the way up to squeaky mouse on this side, right? So the very high pitch ee, ee, and the very low pitch, mm, the lower sounds, right? So that kind of gives you the geography of an audiogram. Now let's look at these little shapes in here. I'm gonna take this line off so we can see it a little more clearly. So you can see there's red and there's blue and there's all kinds of shapes. There's X's, there's O's, what is happening? So the thing to know is that there's gonna be a different sort, set of shapes for each ear. And we don't care too much as members of the public outside of the field of audiology and SLP, what shapes they're using here. The shapes simply tell us how each level of sound was assessed. So I put the key over here. X means left. So these blue X's are assessing the left ear. Circle means right. The right is in red. That's another good way to remember, right, red. A lot of us get our audiograms and audiology reports in black and white faxes. So the colors don't help us so much there. Now there's other shapes that show different kinds of assessment that an audiologist might choose to do based on the circumstances, whether somebody's assessing the hearing through the bone or through the ear, there's lots of options. Again, we don't care too much about that. What we care about is this line. So I'm gonna stick with the plan here. We're gonna do blue for left. And you can see that this person's hearing in their left ear is all higher than this 20 decibel mark. That means they have normal hearing in their left ear. Let's think about their right red. Again, all above the 20 decibel mark, they have normal hearing in their right ear. So we care about this sort of line, how these dots are connected, right? If somebody has an audiogram like this, they have normal hearing, which means that we are not concerned about hearing as a reason for them to have difficulty with speech, right? So if we're trying to teach sounds, we don't have to ask ourselves the question, can they actually hear that sound? We know that physically, yes, they can hear it. Okay. So let's move on to different kinds of hearing loss sound or shapes and sort of what those look like. Let's cruise over here. Again, lots of shapes, lots of things going on here, but what we care about is the line. So let's look at our blue left first. Okay, so remember that 20 decibels is our normal hearing. This person starts with normal hearing, great, going along okay, but whoop, we dip down here and we end up somewhere around 40. That means they have hearing loss in that left ear. Let's look at the right. Again, starting right on the threshold of normal hearing <clears throat> and then dipping, this one goes significantly further down to about 90 decibels, which is very loud. That means that they can only hear sounds right here if they're extremely loud. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna overlay these onto what we call the speech banana. So let's take a look here. So when we think about speech sounds, they kind of fall into this arc right here. And let's take a peek here. So this guy started with normal hearing on the left. All right, so they started around 20 and it dipped down to about 40, 45. So we're gonna connect our dots 
And this is not as incremental as the audiogram was, but you'll get the idea here. So everything above this line, that person can't hear. So that's important to know. If you're working on the F, the S, the TH sound, and their line, their audiogram line is here, they can't hear you when you do that, especially if they don't have a hearing aid. Let's look again. I gotta check my numbers. So they were gonna start here at normal hearing and it was gonna go whew, way down there to 90. So let's see what that looks like for their right ear. Remember right red, so it moves on down. So it's starting off pretty normal. Here we go. And it was cruising way down to about 90. So what is that gonna mean for that person in terms of the speech sounds they can hear? Whoa, everything above the line, they can't hear it. So that means in their right ear, they can't hear sh, ch, g, p, h, k, s. That's a lot of sounds. That means if you're trying to give this person verbal instructions, they're only hearing maybe half the word, right? And this could be why some of our students are misbehaving because they can't actually hear. Okay, so that's one where the ears don't match. Now, if you're thinking about this, you're like, oh, okay. So that means they hear better in the left ear. I'm gonna present my instructions to their left ear where they're gonna hear better. They're not hearing everything, but they're at least hearing this K, B, P, H, G, these kind of sounds in the middle here, which their right ear can't catch, right? Okay, let's look at one other one. I'm gonna check it out over here. All right, let's take a little look. So again, we're seeing hearing loss here because we can see that these lines are below the 20. So in their red right ear, it goes way down to about 80 and it matched by their left ear. Going up and going down to about 80, 90. So let's take a look here. I'm gonna delete these other ones. You can see, what does that mean for this person? So it's gonna start off pretty normal and it's gonna drop down to 90, whoa. Right ear, same thing, dropping down to about 90. That means it doesn't really matter which ear you're gonna present instructions to, they're not hearing all of this stuff up here, right? And that really means that they really, really, really need to have and use hearing aids. And hearing aid technology has really come a long way. Um, I would speak to your audiologist about this so they can find something that will work for your child. And then I would speak to an OT. And the reason I would speak to an OT is because that is the person who's gonna give you strategies on how to help our students tolerate the hearing aids. One thing to have one, it's another thing to use it consistently. So by tolerate, we mean wearing it without complaining, wearing it without ripping it out and throwing it after five minutes, that kind of thing. And the OT is the person you need to help you with that. I wanna talk about one last thing, and that is other things that can affect our hearing aside from true hearing loss. So if we look right here, let's look at earwax. If we have a really big field of earwax and it's all plugged, then these lines, you can expect both of them to go lower. If you have a student who needs or depends on noise canceling headphones, again, these lines need to go way lower. A noise canceling headphone, if it's working well, dampens sound or makes quieter by about 25 to 30 decibels. So everywhere along this line is gonna go down a whole chunk, which means that if your student has hearing loss, they're gonna hear even less than they normally would, okay? So I hope this gives you a little walkthrough of what an audiogram is and what it's for and how you can use it to help you make choices for your student in terms of, are we gonna work on this sound right now if we know they're not hearing or are we gonna work on something else? And maybe we'll give you some strategies for who to talk to for hearing aid support and that kind of thing. All right, thanks for joining me.